So everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to kind of take a back seat on this one because uh, my two guests are just so esteemed and so talented that they have way more useful things to say than I could ever say on this subject. Um, you know them as a beater pair for uh, currently Boston Pandas as well as the Boston Knight Riders as well as Team USA, previously with QCB. Uh, they've won titles with just about all of those teams. Uh, Max Havlin and Lulu Zhu. Uh, I don't think they've ever kind of really publicly talked about beating on a such a detailed scale, so I think this is a really exciting content. I'm super excited to hear about it from them. So uh, I'm going to let them take it away. Max and Lulu, go for it. Thanks for having us. Of course. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ethan. <laughs> Um, so we had always kind of thought about um, how we can better explain beating, um, and recently Grace was on one of your midline videos, and she did an excellent job, and I really felt inspired by that, so we thought that maybe we could try to do something similar with beating. For sure. Um, and there was just so much to put that we had to end up cutting it to just playing with one bludger, <laughs> and then hopefully we can move on to two bludgers um, sometime in the future. So, um, can you go to the next slide? For sure. So, I just wanted to put this disclaimer um, that we are in no way saying that this is the only way to beat. Um, there is no 100% right or wrong way to beat. We kind of just broke down some of our experiences um, in beating and to set up some strategies that we're hoping can be used by newer beaters or coaches of newer beaters. Um, and if you do watch really good beaters, you'll, you'll see them do some like crazy things and really high risk, high reward situations. Um, and we really encourage creativity in beating, but um, we do think it's important to understand some of the fundamentals first before you get to that point. Um, so, and then just another disclaimer as well. So we, we, um, we will be showing a lot of clips throughout this presentation and we tried really hard to kind of diversify um, the, the games and the people that we're showing, um, but we were kind of limited by the quality of the film footage. Um, and so they're primarily from MLQ and Nationals. No, I think that's something we've all kind of run into as we go through film footage. And I really like what you were saying about the right or wrong way to beat uh, because I mean, I, I'm obviously not a beater. I'm not the best at training beaters. I think, you know, I'm very lucky to have you guys coaching the beaters at Harvard. Um, but, like, when I coach beaters, I really just try to make sure they at least know the basics because you can get far with the basics, and then it's kind of that elite step that's really kind of doing the creative things, doing the unique things. But I think, like, you can get very far with just kind of the things that you are going to teach in this video. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is kind of just an overview of what we're going to talk about. So the first one is um, we're going to break down some beater role terminology, which um, hasn't been really used in analysis. So usually when people talk about beaters, they say male beater or female beater, um, which is re really not specific enough. Um, uh, and so I guess we can start here. Yeah. So um, I'm going to try and explain this as concisely as possible. Um, so I'm just going to say kind of conceptually what I mean by this and then objectively how I'll be using um, it throughout the presentation. So generally when you break down a beating play, you have um, a beater who either starts or defends against the beater duel, and we're going to call them the engaged beater. And then the partner is going to be um, either anticipating that beater duel or reacting to it, and we're going to be calling them the free beater. Mm -hmm. So um, I just also want to emphasize that these roles can switch back and forth between partners with each play. So um, you don't have to be the engaged beater the entire time you're in. Um, if you and your partner both feel equally comfortable with either of these roles, like maybe you split them 50-50. Um, but I do see beaters, a lot of beaters do tend a little bit more towards one or the, end, one or the other, depending on who you're playing with or who you're playing against. Um, and I also kind of want to emphasize that um, both these skills um, and roles are equally important, and you really need a balance um, to have a good... Um, beating partner set. So, um, and then kind of objectively how, if you go back again, yep. sorry. No, so if you um, objectively, how we're, we're going to break this down throughout this presentation is, um, because we're just talking about one bludger, it's easy. So the partner that's holding the bludger is going to be the engaged beater. The partner without the bludger is the free beater. And it gets a little bit trickier with two bludgers, but we're going to say, you know, in a beater play, the partner that is starting or defending against that beater duel is the engaged beater, and then the other one automatically becomes the free beater. So, and the reason we're kind of doing this, um, if you go to the next slide now, is um, for a couple of reasons. So, um, for one, I think one of the most important ones is it takes 
gender out of the discussion when you're talking about leader skills or responsibilities. Um, so what I've heard in the past is, you know, you might have a female beater who is very aggressive, really good at beater duels, and um, I've heard people say, oh, she's so good, she plays like a male beater, um, used as a compliment. And I think we can all kind of all see why that um, isn't, is a little problematic. Um, so instead, if you take the gender out of it, you say, oh, she's a great engaged beater. Um, that kind of gets the same meaning. Um, but doesn't assign skills or responsibilities by a specific gender. Um, and do you, do you either of you have thoughts on that before I move on to the next point? Yeah, um, I think I think the whole concept of free beaters is great. I think it's a super underrated role. I feel like a lot of engage beater. Uh, kind of mechanics aren't actually necessarily that complicated like you're throwing or you're going for a dodge um, like or a throwback there's like a few things the free beater has to be reading so many more things um, the hardest thing in beating from an outsider's perspective and maybe you guys don't agree or maybe you do is making that instantaneous decision about how to run the rest of the play after the exchange happens and that responsibility almost always falls fully on the free beater and i think mm -hmm. how good your free beater is at that almost defines like how your entire beater pair is going to be able to play together and so i think for the, all those reasons it's kind of a good yeah. idea to kind of specifically give a definition to that role yeah absolutely that kind of brings us to the next point which is i think by uh, sorry if you go back to the previous sorry. slide um the next point which is um by defining these two roles, it's helpful for your training new beaters. So um, oftentimes, if you have you know two new beaters um, and you're just telling them to work together, a lot of times what happens is the more competent player tends to choose to be the engaged beater role because they want to be throwing. And a lot of times that tends to be the male beater because um, male players tend to have had more throwing sports growing up. They might be more used to it. And um, this is kind of a disservice to um, all your players. So for the male beater, um, no matter what beater role they, they end up in, um, you have to understand both to be effective. And if you do end up as an engaged beater, you have to understand, as we said, you know, this, this is just like, yeah, position um, and decision making, and um, it helps to play as the free beater um, to understand that. And then for any female or gender non-conforming beaters, um, they often might not have the opportunity to develop as an engaged beater if, um, coaches don't kind of specifically put them in those roles. Um, and then the last point, which is, as kind of you, as you said, by defining the uh, roles of the free beater, um, you can kind of ex better explain what this kind of confusing role does. Um, and a lot of that comes from experience, so positioning, awareness, decision making. Um, and if you specifically tell free beaters what they can do, then they can learn from that. And if you're a coach and you don't really know exactly what free beaters can do, we're hoping that this presentation can break some of that down. Yeah, and, and um, I think in a way, the way we always say that a lot of great beaters were chasers first because that allows them to understand the game on a like more widespread level. I think beaters who have played both kind of beater roles will also have a more widespread level of being able to play the yes. game. Yes, yeah, exactly. So um, we're going to start with talking about offense, specifically um, game control. Um, so Max is going to... Oh, actually, I think maybe I'll, I, I'll talk about this first, and then Max will go over yeah. what happens afterwards. Um, so some just some overarching concepts. So one is have a plan. So you always should be on the same page as your beating partner and your chasers before the play even begins. And so there's two basic sets that we're going to go over. Um, one is front and back, and one is side by side. Um, you can read kind of the description of them there, but we'll talk about them in detail going forwards. And then the second point is adjust on the fly. So even though you are going in with a plan, you should always be reading your opponents to see when they make a mistake so that you can capitalize on that even if it didn't fit your original plan. So even if you and your partner are intending on you know, beating out the beater on the right, if the one on the left gets over aggressive and out of position, you should just turn on them. Um, and then the last one is don't overstay. So this is a very common mistake you see in a lot of beaters, um, both college and club level. You know, I've done this before. So sometimes, you know, you're just, you really want to get control. Um, and but there are times when the play is going to be over. Like either your chasers are going to get shut down at hoops, or your chaser is about to score, um, and you have to anticipate what's going to happen next. And the most important thing is that you have to have at least one bludger on defense. Otherwise, it's going to be a fast break. So um, bludger control is great, but don't try and get at the expense of, you know, not having bludger on defense. Yeah, for sure. I think you two are some of the best at kind of 
knowing when to go for budget control versus whether when to have a budget back to make sure the other team doesn't score and when to trust your chasers, etc., which I think you'll probably get into further on. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we can talk a little bit more now about uh, the specifics here of the two ways you can try to get control. Yeah, so for this side, we have the engaged beater tips. Um, so beginning control. Um, so when you're the beater with the budger, you draw so much attention. So what you do with that budger and that attention is really kind of the make or break of what happens. Um, kind of some tips to go along with that. Um, a few things that you don't want to do. Um, you don't want to rush um, forward without your free beater in a good position. If you go in blindly and your free beater is tagging up the hoops, you're outnumbered. You seldom will ever win that. Um, and then do not hesitate. When you see an adjustment and you want to capitalize on something, just go for it. Don't hesitate. You'll learn from your mistake if you if it is a mistake. Um, that's the only way you'll learn. Um, don't hesitate. And then do not become strictly reactionary. Um, you want to kind of try to control the flow if you can. Um, be the one that engages. Be the one that throws. Force them into a throw you. Um, if you're the reactionary one, um, you kind of lose some of the advantages that you're trying to create. Um, the three things to really try to do, be aware of quaffle play. Um, quaffle play is huge for getting control. Um, dictate the beater battle kind of goes along with the don't be reactionary. And then be aware of your partner at all times. Um, make sure your free beater is in a great spot, in a good positional spot, um, and then you can engage, attack. Um, or you can at least grab the attention to your, for your free beater and make a play. I love your point about being aware of quaffle play because the fact of the matter is you have one bludger and the other team has two bludgers, so the numbers are really, really stacked against you if the quaffle play doesn't at least have to slightly be in those other two beaters' minds. So you really need your quaffle play to kind of at least be making something happen or at least be putting some pressure on those beaters or else you're just facing such high stakes, I feel like, to try to get control. Exactly. All right, and I think Lou is going to pick up on the free beater tips. Yeah. So for this, um, as we said, your positioning, decision making, and awareness are what's most important. And you might feel kind of useless because you're the one, the only one that's not holding a bludger. But really, uh, where you're positioned and what you do is kind of crucial to the play. So um, some things that I see all the time, also in um, a lot of college beaters, is um, so first is don't get beat before the play begins. So sometimes um, the engaged beater, your partner is kind of like walking up with the ball carrier and then I see the free beater just like run up by themselves and try and like tackle um, a ball or r- try and wrestle a ball away by themselves and I've almost never seen that actually be successful so a lot of times what ends up happening is you just get beat out um, before your partner is in position to make a move and then you're kind of wasting the next like eight seconds running back to your hoops and coming back so um, be careful about um, when the play is beginning and then secondly, after play's over, if your partner is beat, as I said before, um, you have to get at least one bludger back on defense. So you have to not get beat, um, whatever you end up doing. Even if it, even if you don't end up getting control, at least getting one bludger back is, um, is good. And the last one is, um, as I said, like your positioning is really important. So sometimes um, you might be playing against a very aggressive beater, and um, if your partner gets beat out, um, you have to kind of anticipate that the next play that that could happen again because this is a very confident beater who's not afraid to throw. So um, you don't want to be too far away from them um, because if your partner is beat out and you're nowhere near the play, what's going to end up happening is the defensive beaters are going to have three bludgers to play with. Um, so make sure that you're kind of near your partner if that happens. And then um, things to do, as Max said, is you know keep an eye on your partner at all times. Communication is really key. And then um, positioning, so you want to be close enough to where you can make, um, you can be part of the play, but also um, not so close that you're an easy beat before the play begins. For sure. So now let's talk about one of those specific sets uh, for getting control. Yeah, so the first one um, we're going to talk about is front and back set, um, probably one of the most common sets you'll see in Quidditch. Um, so the engage beater is at stays at the top with the ball carrier while the free beater um, wraps around behind the opposing defensive beaters. Um, so that set, um, you always want to kind of always gravitate towards one defensive beater. You kind of want to focus together one defensive beater in these sets. Um, if you're both focusing a different defensive beater, so if I can this example of triangle one on triangle and square one on square, 
your chances of success kind of drop. Um, so the advantages of this front and back set, um, the engage feeder um, does not have to commit a budget. Like if you're up top um, and your free beater makes a play to make a poke out or something, you actually don't actually have to throw, um, which is pretty pretty important because then you can always guarantee a budget back. Um, so you don't always have to throw in the set. Um, and then both engage and free beater can see each other. Easy, um, easily allowing easier communication. So a lot of times like people say you have to talk, you have to talk. In game, it's sometimes really hard to talk. Um, <laughs> And so this front and back set really helps with communication because it's all visual. You can see what your partner's doing. You can read what they're pointing at. Sometimes you can motion each other. Um, it kind of increases the level of communication you can have. Um, but one of the biggest dis disadvantages is you are separate. Um, so if you're separate and the defensive beaters try to isolate one of you and attack one of them, it's hard to kind of help each other out in that scenario. Um, and so... Disadvantage, be really careful. <laughs> um, if if uh, defense beaters are really sticking together, this may not be the best set for it. Um, and you can go next. Yep. And so we have uh, kind of three ways to get control off of this set. Um, so we have the first one, um, so playing off attack, um, which is where the engaged beater goes for a play at the top, and the free beater kind of collects the budget. So there's like exchange up top, free beater goes in and collects the budget on the ground. Um, so you can go ahead and click on that orange link. Uh, we have uh, three quick clips. Okay. All right, so we have um, Austin versus Rochester. Um, you can go ahead and click um, play on it. Is, yep. is it playing? Yep. Yeah, playing. Um, so we have the free beater being Marshall, engaged beater being Iraqi. Um, we're going to be focusing on Austin, the blue beaters. And then we'll pause the video soon to see kind of where everyone's set up. And you can kind of pause. Pause now, that's fine. All right. Yeah, that's fine. So, the, it's a little off screen, some beaters, but you'll see them come on screen um, shortly. But uh, Naraki um, is by midline beater. Um, his partner is behind. Um, behind kind of the Rochester beaters, which are both together right there. Cool. Um, and so, what's going to happen? I'll explain really quick what's going to happen, then we'll see it play out. Um, so, Naraki's going to get in a beater battle exchange. Um, Butch is going to be on the ground. His partner, Marshall, is going to run up kick a budget back, and then does a very smart thing. Um, she realizes her budget is back, Naraki's tagging up, he'll have that, and she waits. And by waiting, she ends up um, getting lucky, and a bad throw happens, and she gets that budget control. Um, so go ahead and play. Wait, Peter exchange. This is, she kicks it back, and bad throw, and she actually goes and collects that. Um, next clip, um, Rochester versus Indy, um, and this is uh, the free beater being um, ELK, and the engaged beater being... So we go ahead and continue. Oh, it's a little choppy. Oh, yeah, you can pause. Yeah. All right, so Perry's up top um, right now. Um, ELK's towards back there, exactly. And then, so we're focused on the white beaters, um, and then uh, we have the orange beaters there. So what's going to happen is uh, Pear is going to try to go beat on uh, Tower Walker. Um, and EOK is already in a great position uh, where Tower being, being Tower is so good at dodging. Jumps over the beat, um, but it goes right to EOK. Um, and they actually capitalize on the mistake to get control after that. So go ahead and play. I think you mentioned that it's good to run this kind of set when the beaters are a little more separated. You can see Tower and Aaron are pretty separated in positioning on this play. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So the front back is great for any beater who's good at dodging. Perry goes for it. Misses. And they actually end up with control with a miss throw. And a no budget. Yep. Um, and then finally, the last clip um, is going to be Ar uh, Austin versus Rochester um, with the free beater, beater being pace and the gauge beater being K. Um, and we can go ahead and bring that up. And we go and pause. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so Hallie Pace, you can't see her right now, but she's basically right at hoops. Um, Tate Pay is up top um, versus the two Rochester beaters. Um, so this, what will happen is Tate will get a beater exchange, um, budges on the ground, and Hallie does something that's really, really good, really smart. 
Um, she waits to see what happens. Because if she rushes up in this video, um, she'll just get beat out um, and nothing will come out of the play. But because she waits and sees kind of what develops, she ends up getting the free budge on the ground and they get control. So go ahead and play. Exchange, and now she's waiting, and now she'll move and get that. Um, and that's really like a lot of the front and back, especially those engages. Um, the free beater, sometimes you just have to be patient and just see what happens. Um, that patience really is rewarding um, in this set. All right, awesome. Um, and now the second way from front and back is kind of anticipating throw back. Um, this is where the engage beater up top throws and possibly fakes a defensive beater. And that defensive beater throws back to hoops. The free beater is already in great position, collects that throw back. Um, and we go ahead and go to that uh, video. All right, um, so this video has a couple clips. Um, this is uh, UT versus Tech State um, with McBride and Wayne. Um, so go ahead and play, and we'll, we'll go ahead and pause it once we see Kylie on the screen. She's right over here, right now. Uh, so the play already happened. Yeah, um, so Can you just um, bring it back? I think you might have missed the play on this one. Yeah, so if you just pause here. Yeah, pause. All right. All right, so, yeah, it's a little blurry on this pause, but um, Kylie is behind hoops, um, and Wong is up top. Um, Texas State beaters have control right now. And what's going to happen is uh, Bailey's going to go aggressive, um, gets caught out of position, the Texas State beater, um, and she throws back to hoops um, right into Kylie, um, kind of waiting there. So there you go. So Jack goes for pressure, throw back, kind of kicks. Um, and then the next one up um, is Boston versus Rochester um, with. The free beater being Lulu, and the gate beater being Mario. And we we'll pause there. So we have right now Mario and Lulu together. Um, and so what's going to happen is Mario does like, something gate beaters don't do enough. He is patient and he waits for Lulu to get in good position. So once Lulu gets in good position, he's going to engage. Um, the Rochester beater is going to go back um, right into Lulu's uh, waiting arms. <laughs> Um, and then the final clip, um, Helen uh, Walker and Weissart in the Austin and New York um, series, the MLQ Championship. And we go ahead and pause there. Um, so right now, um, Tyler is closer to hoops, um, and he's already in good position. He's kind of reading the play. He could maybe go for a poke out, why not? He's a very good positional strategy and also potentially for the throwback which is going to happen so Cole on Austin in blue um, he went up aggressive um, and Weishart read that read that and Weishart um, puts pressure Cole, Cole throws back um, kind of like a perfect throw right past two Tyler um, <laughs> I want to rethink that one but um, this is really kind of because Tyler's in such a good position um, it looks really easy um, so we'll go ahead and play Go back, right in his hands, and then they make put up that. All right, um, and then a third um, strategy to use, which is one of my favorites, is the poke out. So this is where the free beater is going behind, um, and then you're kind of getting into um, one of the defensive beater's blind spots, and then you go and you kind of smack that ball out of their hands. Um, so if you, <laughs> this is with me and Mario, uh, Rebs versus Warriors at Crescent City um, this past year. Um, so if you play and then pause. Once the play begins, okay, and then pause here. So, um, so you can see that I, I am, I don't know if you can see, yep. right, yeah, exactly right there. And then Mario's up top, um, and this is, um, as we talked about, like the disadvantages of this play is that um, you can isolate one or the other. Um, so it works with with Mario because he's so good at blocking that beaters don't want to attack him. And then with me going around, a lot of people just kind of. I think forget about the free beater. Um, so a couple of tips for this. Um, I try and when I'm going up behind, I, I go up on the opposite side of the field as the other team's bench. Um, because sometimes um, 
I get lazy and I just go up on the side of the field I, I'm at and like 100% of the time when I'm going in front of their bench someone notices and yells for their beater to pay attention to me so um, it's, it's a small advantage to go up on the opposite side of the field and then um, whether like the uh, in terms of like how long you wait um, if you see that they're not paying attention to you you should go right away um, because sometimes they'll remember to look for you um, and in this particular case um, it was a very short amount of time so I'm going behind and I kind of immediately go so if you play the clip um, and then it's pretty easy um, I, I have a question for you, Lulu. On, on a play yeah. like that, sometimes obviously you poke out perfectly clean, the ball like goes all the way back mm -hmm. to your side of the field and the play's over, but in cases where you don't, do you expect your engaged beater to necessarily make a play there, or do you know that sometimes you're kind of more on your own in that situation? Or um, Yeah, I, I think I definitely expect my engaged beater to help out if it's not a clean beat, because um, there's, there's nothing else that they have to be throwing at at that moment, so you might as well try and get control back. Um, and your engage beater can even help. If they see you're going behind and they're anticipating that you might be trying to sneak up, they can really try and bring all the attention to themselves, um, which I, which is um, Max and Mario are both very good at that. For sure. And I also just want to say for the, the, the defensive beaters who uh, were using these clips, like, I'm very sorry. Like, we've all been in that position where someone steals our ball, and so we're not trying to, like, you know, <laughs> point them out in any way. Uh, it's just, these are just the clips that we found. Sure. Um, so this next one is with Kylie and Jack again, um, UT versus Cal from last year's Nationals. And if you pause um, here... I can go a little so further if you want. Okay, oh. yeah. So Kylie's going behind, and she actually waits a little bit longer. So um, you can't see her in the frame, but she's on the um, left side. Um, and she's just waiting and waiting, and then um, as soon as that beater, you can see that he's not paying any attention to her at all, she makes her move. So... I believe that's Ivan Avalos. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really a fundamental um, thing for beaters is you have to be aware of where all the beaters are on the field at all times. Um, and this next one is with Leanne and Mario, um, Boston versus Casey. Um, so if you pause here. Yeah, so um, I realized what maybe for people who are unaware of um, which teams are which. Um, Boston is purple and um, Kansas City is the yellow. So, and Mario and Leanne are on the uh, left side kind of of the field. And um, Leanne doesn't actually really do the poke out very often. So I think in this particular case, she was going around to do a front or back, um, but she sees that that beater wasn't paying attention to her at all. And so she just takes advantage of the opportunity and comes in and kind of like plucks the bludger out of her hands. <laughs> yeah, that, that was also a poke out, more of just a literally take out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's like reading the situation. Like, you For go sure. around, but you realize, oh, wait, they're not paying attention to me. Just go now. Yep. Um, and that's exactly what we had. Just, and, it look, and it looks great. She just basically just grabbed it out of there. So um, that was the first basic set. The second one is side side. So this is where both the engage beater and the free beater are next to each other up top. Um, so a couple advantages of this is that um, because you're next to each other, it's maybe easier to communicate um, and maybe react to any bounces that happen in that area. Um, and as I had said, it's great against aggressive beaters so that if the engaged beater is beat out, the free beater is in a good position to maybe capitalize off of those bounces. Um, disadvantages is, um, so one is kind of a, a like mind game thing. So if um, both the offensive beaters, the red beaters are kind of in sight, the blue defensive beaters might um, want to play more passively because they can see them. And so um, they might not throw as often, and um, beaters that don't throw, it's really hard to get control from them. Um, and then the second thing um, is that because you're both in the same area, it could be easy to, for both of you to get beat out. Um, but we'll go through some um, strategies that you can use in this set. So the first one we have um, for kind of the side-by-side -side is playing off attack. Um, so this is where the engage beater goes for a play at top, uh, it's like a double B scenario. And the free beater, because of the positioning, um, collects the budgers uh, and kind of completes the play. All right, so uh, here we go, um, video for side to side playing off attack. Um, so this first one's going to be Boston versus Austin with um, Mario and Leanne, uh, Leanne being the free beater. 
go ahead and bring up the boom. Two. And go ahead, pause. All right, so right away, you can see right away the position is different from the front and back. Um, so you have Mario Land in purple um, up top, um, Land's to the left of Mario, and then the Austin Beaters in blue. Um, and so it's very, you can tell it's a little bit uh, stronger. Um, they're together. It's a little bit more dangerous for Austin to make a play. Um, and so what's going to happen is Mario is going to pump fake a few times, eventually get a double beat happen, and Leanne just picks up the budgers um, pretty clean. Go ahead. Cool. The yeah, next one is uh, USA vs. Belgium uh, finals in World Cup uh, with Bailey Fields and Jack Jackson Johnson. Um, kind of the same thing as the earlier video, um, except Jackson really forces this one. Um, so we had pause. So Jackson right there, Bailey to the right, um, and then Lee um, and Belgium in the red up top. Um, and so Jackson really forces this play, um, and it kind of plays out for food for Bailey with the batches. And the most important thing for free beaters for these plays again is that you don't get beat out by that other the second defensive beater. For sure. Yeah. So if you can only get one budger, you can only get one budger. That's it. Um, and then uh, the last one um, is actually Lou and I um, against uh, Lone Star while we're at QCB. Um, go ahead and go through. And go ahead, pause. Um, so, Lulu's the engage beater here. I am the free beater. Um, and then Lone Star has budget control. Eric is up top in black. Um, and so, we're trying to bait out Eric's throw on the Lulu. Um, and so, when he throws, Lulu makes a great block. Um, she beats out Eric right away after making that block. And then I just go collect the budget at the far end. And one of the points is also, as the engage beater, you don't have to throw. You're just, um, you could be baiting out a throw for as part of the beater duel. Uh, now, Lou, on this play, I guess you're pretty confident that Max is getting the other budger. Are you immediately switching to offense here? I don't think we have any more clip here. Or are yeah. you usually just resetting and then taking it from there? Yeah, I did switch immediately to offense um, to beat her out. And then the next one is the pass. Um, so this is where um, you're playing as the very aggressive beater and the engaged beater, instead of throwing the ball at the um, defensive beater, you're passing to your partner. Um, and in the process of that, you're trying to catch or dodge the bludger that's being thrown at them. Um, but the most important thing is that you're passing. So this is with um, Max and I um, against Boston versus Austin MLQ championships. Um, so if you play and then pause, Okay, pause here. Um, so on the left is uh, Max with the ball. Um, I'm the free beater without the ball. And um, yeah, you see the Austin beaters there. And so the entire tournament, the Austin beaters are all extremely aggressive. And so we thought there was a good chance they were probably gonna throw at Max. And so um, what Max is gonna do is he um, is gonna um, anticipate that throw. As soon as that throw happens, he passes to me. And then he tries to make a catch um, on the, the beat. He doesn't end up making it, but that's totally fine because um, now I have the bludger and then I can make an easy beat. So um, as I said, this is a great way against um, aggressive beaters. This next one is with um, Cole Travis and Augie Monroe, Cal versus Terminus, um, last nationals. Um, so if you pause here, so um, you'll see um, Augie's in the middle of the screen holding the ball. Um, he's on the blue team. And then Cole is number 19 next to him. And then Terminus Beater is on the bright side of the screen. So Augie is going to pump fake. He's kind of beating out that throw. And then as soon as it happens, he passes to Cole, who um, cleans up. I think he actually dodged it, but it's okay if he didn't because Cole yeah, had the Cole budget. had the beat either way, for sure. Exactly. Um, and this next one is with um, uh, Michael Chenevay Soup, uh, also known as Soup, and then um, with Max. This is um, Boston versus New York um, championships, and um, so you play, and then you pause here. So um, yep, that's Max with the ball. Um, Soup 
is right there um, as a free beater, and then the two New York beaters, one is um, right near Max, and then one is in front of the hoops. So uh, Max and Soup don't actually play a, too lot to, a whole lot together, so I'm not sure if Soup was anticipating that throw. <laughs> um, and I think this is also kind of important to point out because he is a little bit close to that um, New York beater. Um, and he ends up reacting very well and um, running away with the bludgers, um, but I think if he had known that the pass was coming, if I were him, I would have positioned kind of farther away. So if you play... All right, and then the final one, um, tackling, uh, which if you know Lou and I, we don't do that often. <laughs> um, but in the Quidditch world, um, it is a very common and pretty strong um, tactic if you have the right players. Um, so this is where the free beater um, goes in for a tackle or at least physically impedes the defensive beater. And while that tackle or impeding is being ha is happening, the gauge beater tries to attempt to make a beat. Um, and we have a couple of examples. All right, so we have a video for um, to. The gate, uh, sorry, the free beater going for a tackle. Um, so in this one, it's uh, Lou and Rosenberg. Um, so go ahead and get up to that. Um, so they're going to be in black, I believe. Yeah, black. Um, go ahead, pause. So Lou's right there. Um, so where we pause the clip, um, she's already kind of engaging. Um, so this is where, like, if you could have a huge tackle bringing the ground, that's great. Um, but um, if you're that beater. Um, and you can't get a firm tackle, even just being physical creates the play. Um, so that's what happens here. So go ahead and play. That physicality sometimes puts in that position. Um, a lot of things can be there having a clean throw. Um, and the next one um, is Boom Train versus Warriors. Um, and it's uh, the free beater being Jones and the engaged beater being Hoffman. Right. Awesome. So um, Jones right now is up front right there, about to engage, um, and she gets a good hand on um, Warriors Beater there. Uh, one thing of note, um, which they do a good job here, but some some problems about the tackling is if you're the free beater, sometimes by tackling, your body gets in the way of a throw. Um, and so that's why some sometimes the tackling one is not – always the best option. Um, but really, you kind of have to play to your strengths. So we'll go ahead and play. And if you are a free beater and you're going in and you realize you're not a super physical beater, at least latch on to one of the arms. Um, if you latch on to the beater arms, they can't make the throw. Um, or they might make a little beat on you and get the ball bouncing. Um, so always latch on to arms if you can't actually take them down. All right, um, so we have uh, quick tips on side-by-side. -side. Um, so specifically, I'm going to talk about the engage beater. Um, so only throw when it's advantageous. Close enough to make a high probable beat or opposing beaters um, separate themselves. So as you inch closer, you have all these options, right? You have to pass. Um, inch closer, once you get close enough where you can make a more guaranteed beat, go for it. Just go for it. Um, and then you can fake aggressiveness to fade out the right. Um, do not wait for the opposing beater to make a play. Like force the action. And so, again, you have the budget. You have a lot of attention on you. Um, if you're constantly pump faking or moving around quickly, um, you can kind of bait out some stuff. Um, and as long as you're trying to bait it out, um, you can make plays off of that. Don't be reactionary. And then for the free beater, um, if I haven't emphasized enough, you can't get beat out if your engaged beater gets beat out. And so that kind of starts with the initial setup. So one thing you can do is position on the outside of your partner so that you are kind of the farthest distance away from the um, second beater, the one that you're not targeting. So you guys mentioned, you know, six different strategies of ways you can get back budget control. And I feel like very specifically, the question I hear the most from like young college beaters is like, this team's turtling their two bludgers right under the hoops. What the heck are we supposed to do to get bludger control? So what kind of things would you tell a young beater who asks a question like that? Um, I, um, I would say um, for remembering that you can always get bludger control back, but you can't get goals back or along those lines. So in those cases when they turtle, Sometimes just switch to Quaffle, help up Quaffle, try to get a goal that way. Um, but really, a lot of times when beaters total, it is a team effort. 
Um, and your chasers have to be on the same page of what you're doing. So if you attack at the same time, you can make the defensive beaters, make hard decisions, get bludgers in the air. Um, to get control, one of your goals is always try to get bludgers in the air. If you get bludgers in the air, then you have chances. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you don't have to get budger control back on offense. You can also very easily do up defense. Um, so let's start talking about defense then. Defense, yeah. So, all right. So um, these are some overarching concepts um, with one bludger. So for one, as we kind of talked about, um, your goal is to stop the quaffle from scoring. Um, at higher levels of beating, you might deviate from this depending on the situation, but a lot of new beaters tend to focus on beaters, and so it's really good to really kind of emphasize that you can't get quaffle points back. Um, the times when you might adjust is if your opponents get too over aggressive, um, and that can happen. So um, if they if they are right at your hoops, you might as well just make a beat on them um, because the bludgers will likely fall kind of right by your hoops, and then you can get control and maybe even stay uh, stay in the play. And then the third point is um, be proactive. So I see this also a lot in um, less experienced beaters, which is where um, you are alone and then one of the offensive beaters kind of starts running at you with the ball. Um, the entire team is maybe running at you and then they kind of, you kind of freeze because you're thinking like, oh, I have to stop the quaffle, but this beater is running at me. And so kind of, I guess our advice is um, don't ever freeze. Like, you can try anything, um, either throw at that beater, throw back to hoops, pass to your partner, try and throw at the quaffle. Um, there's no right answer for what to do in that situation, but the last thing you want to do is just freeze while holding the bludger. For sure. Um, and then the last one is positioning. Um, I mean, I think we just have to say this. So you only have one bludger, so um, try to stay at least somewhat centralized so that you're um, not getting too far out of position. Um, and then we're going to go over two basic sets that you can use. Um, one is with a free beater in front, directly in front of one of the um, opposing beaters, and the other one is with free beater as a passing option. Uh, so, Lou, I'm sure we're going to talk about this in the two uh, bludger presentation, but um, we know you love to kind of make those early tap beats to take wing chasers out of the play when it's available to you. Do you ever mm-hmm. ma- are those ever situations where that pops up with one bludger, or are you almost always just centralized? Uh, even like super early in a play with one bludger. Yeah, so I don't, I don't think I usually get pulled um, away with one bludger um, because what happens is when you get pulled away, that person's probably going to pass to someone um, back near the hoops. So um, I would only make a B if it's kind of clear that your defensive chasers can stop any drives, mm-hmm. um, and you ha- and I think that if the unmarked chaser is out of the play. Um, at that point, I think you can make a play and you can sort of hope that your chasers, I guess trust that your chasers have the other people covered. For sure. Um, okay. So this is um, a setup that's used by like 90 to 95% of beater pairs. So this is with the free beater. Um, you're keeping your body directly in front of one of the um, opposing offensive beaters, and the goal is to essentially to take one of them out of that play so your partner only has to focus on the other offensive beater and the quaffle. Um, so we can, I think we can watch an example. First. Okay, so this is um, with Rachel Ayala Silver and Devin Lee, um, Austin versus New York at the last MLQ Championships. Um, so if you play and then pause. All right. So, um, Devin and Rachel are the two beaters in black. That's Devin, and that's Rachel. She's, um, you can see she's gonna kind of go up in front of the Austin beaters. So there's Tate and Kylie for the, in blue. She's up against Kylie. And she um, tries to go for a tackle, which um, I don't think I would normally advise that, just because it has such a, a low chance of actually succeeding and getting um, the bludger. And so you're kind of, I feel like, wasting your energy. But um, I think it's, it's good to just kind of switch things up. So she goes for the tackle, it doesn't work out, but she's still in position. And then Tate um, is the um, engaged beater, um, and he's kind of making taps on chasers. And so um, one of the taps kind of takes a weird bounce. And because um, Rachel, the free beater, is in such a good position up top, she's able to capitalize off of that. So if you play, um, the tackle doesn't work out, that's okay, she's in position. That bounce um, from the tap beat goes far, and she picks it up, and they get control. 
Um, so that's one way you can do. And so this one um, is with Jack Wang and um, Kylie McBride. Um, so they're on defense, and Jack is um, going to be the free beater. Um, if you pause here, so right here, exactly. And he does um, a really good job here, which you don't see a lot in um, people who are doing this, is that usually um, when you're trying to block someone, like you see that their enti your entire focus is on, on that person you're blocking, and you have no idea what's happening behind you. But you're going to see that Jack um, starts to like, look behind him to see, because um, Jess Markle is the um, Texas state beater who's going to be making a... Um, an offensive beat and so he's looking behind and then when he sees her go he um, immediately reacts off to it and um, is able to get the bounce back of the ball so he's blocking blocking doing a good job and then just throws um, and he turns and then is able to collect that bounce um, so I think that's the ideal way if you pause that's the ideal way of doing um, this play the only thing is that if you keep looking behind you, it's going to be um, very easy for the beater that you're trying to defend against to beat you out. So that's kind of a disadvantage. Um, and then this last example is with Cole Travis, and I believe her name is Claire Costanza. Yeah. Um, so they're going to be the defensive um, beaters on Austin. And Cole does also a good job where he he's going to be um, defending against Tyler Walker. So if you pause here, so Tyler's right there. Yep. And then the other beater is um, Fiona Weishart, who is um, farther down. And so um, Cole is primarily on Tyler first, um, but then as Fiona kind of creeps up, he switches to her. So he's kind of like looking at both of them. And that's another way that you could potentially do this. And Fiona comes in, and then um, he switches to her. There's also something to be said, I suppose, for kind of switching to the... Beater who's on the side that the quaffle's on, because that's kind of where the attack is coming from. Exactly, right. And um, another way that this is really helpful is if you are defending against one and a half. So one and a half is um, when the offensive beaters leave their bludgers, um, usually at their hoops or somewhere kind of farther down the field, and then they go up and try and make a tackle without a bludger. Um, so as we said, this is also a good way to defend against one and a half, because you're kind of... Same concept, like physically stopping one of the beaters from getting at your partner. Um, so if you pause here, this is a very short clip. Um, it was really hard to find examples for some reason. So Ben, I believe this is Ben Wong, he is um, defending against Jack. So Jack is the orange beater there. Um, he's had a few um, successful one and a half this that game, um, but Maryland, um, <laughs> the Maryland Wong does a good job of um, using Jack's momentum um, to kind of push him in a circle to the side. Um, and that's sometimes more uh, effective than trying to stop him altogether. So if you play, yeah, it's a very short clip. Yeah, and I, I, I always advise beaters, like when, you're, when your teammate's kind of pushing to the side, that's kind of your hole to kind of step up into, and then that beater who's trying to attack you is like behind you and he's completely out of the play, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and then this next clip is with Tate K, Kylie McBride, um, actually these next two clips are of them. So this one, um, if you pause, so he, um, is defending against New York's beater, um, and at this point he actually, he did, he was able to keep him off for a few seconds, but then, um, he actually, the New York beater actually gets through. Um, I think if you play it. So he did a pretty good job, but um, it, it can be really hard to really stop someone. Um, and then this is kind of a little bit later in the game, probably like a minute later, um, and he does an even better job of kind of really physically pushing him away. And the important thing is you can't tackle, obviously, because none of you have a ball. Um, so right there, exactly. And then, um, yeah, you can just play. And he does a really good job of keeping him. Um, so... There are also a few disadvantages to um, this kind of setup, and um, Max and I actually really don't like playing it because of these reasons. So um, for one, as we kind of said, um, because you're kind of putting your whole focus and trying to stop um, one of the beaters, um, as a free beater, it's kind of hard to see what's happening behind you, so it's hard for you to play off of it. Um, it's also easier for you to get beat out because you're kind of directly in front of someone, and they can make a very you know easy, small beat on you. Um, and then lastly, this can just be a hard thing for smaller or less physical beaters. 
And you can definitely train small beaters to be physical, and many are very good at it, but I always say you shouldn't play to your weaknesses. So if being physical isn't your strength, um, you shouldn't play a strategy that requires it just because everyone else is doing it. So um, we'll go over some a few other things that you could possibly do if you don't like this kind of setup. So um, this is something this is <laughs> something that Max and I have kind of played around with, um, and I honestly haven't quite made up my mind if I liked it or not. But um, we'll show you a couple examples of when this has worked, and then people can decide if they liked it or not. So this is with the free beater kind of halfway in front. You're not committing to either of the offensive beaters. You're not. Um, you're, you're not trying to stop any of them. You're kind of there so that you're anticipating that the beaters are going to be making a play and then you're going to play off of it. Um, and this is good against two aggressive beaters where even if you were up in front of one of them, um, the other one is probably going to go. So it kind of, um, you, at least maybe you can make a play off of this. Um, and it's good because you can be more involved in the play. Um, and we can watch an example. Um, so this is with Max and I, uh, Boston versus Austin. Um, so if you play and then stop when the clip begins. Alright, so this is, you can see the setup here. It's um, me, I'm kind of right next to Max. Um, I'm not really trying to defend against either one of those beaters. Um, the beaters are Jackson, Johnson, Bailey Fields. Um, you can see they're kind of up um, behind the uh, keeper line, or I guess in front of it. Um, so they're both extremely aggressive, so um, we kind of knew that if we, even if we stopped one of them, the other one was probably going to make a beat. So um, we were kind of just anticipating that they were going to try and beat out Max, and then I would make a play from it. So if, um, what's going to happen is Bailey's going to make a good beat, but then because I'm in position to react to it, um, we're able to get control. So if you play... And then I don't think that would have happened if I was you know, directly in front of Jackson. Right. Um, and here is another clip, um, say, I think the second game of the series. So if you pause, um, so Max is kind of at hoops right now with the bludger. Um, and then I am um, kind of right, right there. Um, so I'm not sure, so I, we're playing against um, Ryan and Rocky and Billy Fields again. Uh, again, both two very aggressive beaters. Um, I hadn't committed to either of them because I didn't know which one was going to throw. Um, but one of them, I think Bailey does throw, and then um, again, because I'm in position, I'm able to make a play off of it. So if you play. Yeah, so those are um, just two examples of times when it has worked out when you're playing against aggressive beaters. So um, those are times when it's worked out, um, and as we said, it's good against two aggressive beaters. But again, the big disadvantage of this is that you could just be overall less effective against either one of them. So I think it's something that um, beaters can play around with and see what they like. All right, and um, this next one, um, something Lulu and I like a lot. Like a lot. Uh, we do this um, pretty frequently when we have one budget. Um, and so this is where the free beater um, actually stands behind the engaged beater. Um, and the, the free beater acts as a passing option. Um, and so the advantages of this, um, so it kind of makes sure the budget is still in position on defense despite an aggressive attack. And so because, like, if you look at the diagram, the free beater, the triangle, um, if the engaged beater passes back, that free beater is still in that central position with one budget. So they can still be active in the play. Um, and so we'll go ahead and watch um, some video of this. All right, um, so this first one um, is going to be with Lou and I. Um, Boston versus New York in the MLQ Championships in 2018. And go ahead, pause. So, um, so this is Lulu's already in great position, right? As previous, she's behind. I know where she is the whole time. Um, and so, what I am trying to do is trying to bait out the army. Um, and Dylan on New York here, um, he goes aggressive, makes it beat. When I pass back, I try to make a catch. Um, I fail on the catch, but the bounce works it out. Works out. Um, this is a good way to possibly just completely turn the table and get control instantly if you do make that catch. So go ahead and play. The important thing is, so um, the ball, New York ball carrier goes as soon as Dylan makes the beat, but because Max threw back, I was in position to react to him. All right. Um, the second one, um, New York, 
Ayala, Silver, and Walker. Okay. And uh, the same situation. So Ritual is right now in front of Hoops um, in black. Towers up top um, with Bludger. I think with this quick pause, he's being thrown at, at this instant. Um, so Tate's making this throw on him, um, and Tower throws back. Um, and I forget if the bounces go go your way, but in this in this set, whether the bounce goes or not, they still have that Bludger in that central position. Yeah, like the worst case here is basically that you are where you started. Mm-hmm. And then one more with Blue Knight. Um, so this is a good highlight because it also highlights a really good play um, by the offense speed here. So go ahead, pause. So right there, um, I'm about to be throwing that. Um, I'm going to throw back to Lulu. Um, and then... What is really cool is the offensive beater here. Um, he's going to throw and then try to go one and a half right away um, on Ruru, which a lot of beaters don't do enough, in our opinion. Um, so it's a really smart play, um, but we can see how it progresses. I believe that's Baldemir Nunez. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so basically with the pass back, um, I was still able to go directly onto the ball carrier. And another thing is the um, Lake City beaters did a, um, what I really liked is that they, um, his partner also stayed in kind of at midline, so she wasn't directly at hoops. So I think that when you do do one and a half, um, you don't have to take everyone like completely out of the play. Even if you just stay at midline, um, you can still make a play afterwards, after the tackle. All right, so we just saw three examples um, that worked, um, but one of the disadvantages of this set um, is if you do it too often. Um, opposing beaters can anticipate the pass and beat out three beater. Um, if you do it too much, you're, the opposing team will realize what you're doing. And so when you throw back um, and you get thrown at, there are two bunches on the ground, so your free beater cannot claim immunity. So if the offensive beaters are organized, um, they can essentially beat out the engaged beater and then free beater right away. Um, so it's definitely something you might regret sometimes if you do it too often, but it's a good thing a wrinkle to throw into it. Yeah, and I think that's a good lesson for beating in general. At least I've always said that like basically doing anything too often is a bad idea because if your tendencies get too obvious, the other beaters, if they're smart and if they're experienced, are going to start predicting what you're going to do. So it's always a good idea to kind of mix up what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so for... Um, the setup we just talked about, the free beater is behind the engaged beater. You don't want to be up... Uh, too far up because both the um, offensive beaters have bludgers and you could get beat out very easily. But in the next setup, um, this is specifically against one and a half um, with the free beater as a passing option. So a lot of um, beaters will basically leave their um, bludgers at hoops um, or at least in a place that's not in the play. They're kind of just guarding it. And so now you as the free beater have kind of free reign to kind of go anywhere on the field um, as a passing option. So um, this is um, good for because it can switch up the defensive look um, depending on where the pass is going, and we'll have one of our clips will kind of show that. Um, and um, again, this is a good option for less physical free beaters who don't want to spend their time trying to, you know, body out someone. <laughs> All right. So um, this is with Hallie Pace and Tate K. Um, Austin versus Rochester Monkey Championships. So if you pause here, you see, um, so the Rochester beater is in white. He's already making a move on Tate, who's holding a bludger, right? And Hallie is um, behind that Rochester beater, um, and she's ready for a pass um, if Tate wants to pass to her. Right, so Tate does, and then he does a good job of then going directly towards defending. Um, this next one is with Cole Travis, um, Augie Monroe, Cav versus Boom Train, um, Last Nationals. Um, So, if you pause, oh yeah, this, this is a pretty good scene. So, um, Augie and Cole are actually very close to each other, um, right in front of Hoops on the right side of the screen. And then, I believe that's Jeremy Hoffman from Boom Train, who is um, trying to be physical. Um, and Augie and Cole essentially just pass between each other to avoid him. And they probably could take that even a step further and be even farther apart, but that works out. 
Um, and this is with um, Max and I, USA versus Australia um, at World Cup. So um, if you pause here, um, so yeah, so I'm holding the bludger kind of um, on the left side, left-ish side of the screen, in the middle, and um, Callum is Australia's ball carrier. He's at midline, right there, exactly. And so he's completely focused on me because I'm the only one with the bludger. Um, Max is actually next to Callum, um, number 14, at midline, and um, Australia is going to go for one and a half, and um, it was, and then I passed Max, and suddenly Max is right next to the ball carrier. So um, this is a good way to kind of switch up the defensive look um, without the chasers kind of realizing it. Yeah, and I will add, um, as a free beater in these scenarios, um, it's really important that you get in a position for a pass. Um, you don't want to just be stationary. Actively get in a position where your partner can pass to you. Um, sometimes if it's advantageous like that, um, close to Quaffle, that'd be great. Um, but as long as you hustle, get in a position for that pass to make it a clean uh, transition. Mm -hmm. And it helps to have, as I said, some distance between you and your partner um, so that you're not um, all kind of crowded in one spot with the um, the tackling beater. So one of the disadvantages is that you and your partner could be so distracted by passing to, to each other that you kind of miss an offensive drive. So um, kind of use this wisely. <laughs> all right, so we kind of covered um, offense, defense with one budger, um, and we could obviously add more hours, 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 more content on that. Uh, but here are kind of three things that kind of experience speeder concepts uh, that we kind of collected for in thinking of one budget scenarios. Um, and so the first one is know your opponents. Um, recognize opponents tendencies and adjust during the game. Change tendencies against beaters you've played against before. Whether that's played before a month ago, um, the same tournament, but at, in bracket play, um, definitely change your tendencies as best you can. Um, the really top elite beaters even if they've never played against opponent, will pick up tendencies right away when you're on the field. Um, the next is capitalize on opponent's mistakes. Um, always look to play off opponent's position errors. Don't be afraid to deviate from the original plan. Remember, Quidditch gets really messy, especially the beater play. Um, it gets very unorganized, chaotic. You have to be able to capitalize on opponent's mistakes. As soon as they have position, just go for it. Don't, don't hesitate. Um, and then maximize area of efficacy. Um, so pass budget between partners to maximize area of efficacy by positioning where Coffin may go and avoiding beaters. This is something I think um, Lulu and I both think that uh, this might be a path for future kind of beater strategy of a lot more passing between beaters to cover more space effectively. Because a budget, just like Coffin, tra travels faster when it's in the air. Um, and so if you can pass to each other, you might be able to cover more space. Um, and so we have examples of all of this on one video. Um, go for it. All right. All right. So the first um, clip is going to be about knowing your opponent. Um, so this is QCB versus uh, Lone Star. Go ahead, pause. Um, so Lou and I up top midfield right now. Um, and then Eric Bilroth is right across from us. So this is the first time we've ever played against him. Um, we didn't know what to expect. And boy, did he take it to us. Um, he... He had a great arm that game. He was confident, throwing really well, definitely out physicaling us. Um, and so you'll see this clip of me getting beat out and then Lulu just getting wrecked. Oh, yeah, he wrecked me a lot this game. <laughs> yeah. Um. And so, um, so this is the clip too. And so this is knowing your opponent. So we played them um, earlier that year, um, and now we meet them again. So go ahead, pause here. So we've seen this clip before um, earlier. But this is actually a clip in the making of like two months. Um, we had this strategy going into this because of that bad city game. We knew he was confident thrower. Um, that's where he gets his confidence. And we knew that I had at least a chance to maybe stay physical with him. Um, ultimately, that would never really be the scenario, but I had the chance. Um, and then also, because he was confident thrower, he would be willing to throw from further away. And so we switched the ball into lose hand. Lulu's hands because Lulu's, compared to me, not known for her throwing um, like I am, so he won't feel kind of too pressured. So he might make a longer beat, um, which happens here.
If it looks, if it looks like I was scared, it's because I was scared. <laughs> um, that was. It's so weird to look at this game. Um, also, so another thing is, um, so that was the first season Max and I beat together. Um, it was my first season playing club. I didn't have a lot of competitive experience in college, um, and beating strategy back then was also um, kind of rudimentary. I think. I think it was really after that season that it's kind of developed, um, and. I think a lot of female beaters, especially at that time, like hadn't had a lot of experience um, being the engaged beater and playing offensively. So, um, but so I think you can use this kind of strategy for any kind of less experienced beater, even now. Um, so if you are going up against a beater who has a much stronger arm than you um, in a beater battle, there are a lot of things that you can do. But one of the things, which is what happened in that clip, is that you beat them into throwing at you, and then you go for either a block or a catch or a dodge, or especially you use a partner to um, play off the bounce. For sure. Mm -hmm. All right, um, and going off the second concept, capitalize on mistakes. This is the first clip with Bailey Fields and Jax Johnson. Um, Austin versus Rochester, go ahead, pause. All right, awesome, so we have right there in blue, um, Jackson Bailey, um, Rochester beaters have control. Um, the Rochester beater on the left is not in great position. Um, and what Jackson does, he does a pump fake. Um, he's solely focused right now on the beater in front of him. He does a pump fake. That beater goes back to hoops, realizing instantly that he has the advantage now. Jackson turns and throws at the beater out of position um, on the left. So we'll go ahead and play. So there's capitalizing on that positional mistake. Right. Um. And this next clip is, um, so that one, Jackson was kind of forcing the um, the play. This one, Cole is very patient. So two, two ways you can play this. So if you pause, you see the New York beaters um, in black. That's um, Janice Liu, who's in the center, and then her partner, who's a little uh, to the right side of the pitch, or left side of the pitch. And then Cole is also on um, that same side, Cole Travis, he's right there, exactly. And then his partner, is there. Um, so Cole, he is on the same side of pitch as um, the, the beater on the left, um, but he's watching Janice the whole time. And so she's kind of creeping up a little bit, and as soon as she gets just a little too far out of position, he attacks. So you watch the play. I think that's Dylan Meehan, by the way, playing with her. Oh, uh, okay. It's really hard to see. Yeah, I know. It's very, very pixely. Um, okay, and then this last clip is, um, as we said, maximizing area of efficacy. So this is kind of just a concept, um, and it's something that we haven't practiced, and we didn't practice for this clip that you're about to watch. But um, I think it's an example of what we're talking about. So uh, Max is kind of um, at the top um, with the bludger, and then, um, I don't know if you see him, he's like near the snitch. Um, and then I don't have a bludger, and I'm at the keeper line. Um, and then the two um, Austin beaters, there's one kind of at midline, and then, uh, is that how Yeah, they're over there. Yeah. So this is kind of the concept of passing between um, partners to um, try and... Um, oh, so in this particular circumstance, um, we were down in secret play, um, and so if we just let Austin come to us, they weren't going to come to us. They were slow balling, of course. So we have to um, try and force them. Um, but how do you press with one bludger? So I think um, there's some ways that you can play around with with doing with one bludger with your passing. So if you play, um, so Max, um, it passes back to me, um, and then I press, I beat out one person. Um, if the drive had happened, Max was in position to get my pass, um, and then he goes up again. Um, and then passes it back to me. Um, and then he get, goes up towards the, um, the midline and gets my pass and then beats out another person. And then the plate goes from there. So I think this is just kind of um, an idea of what to do. I think there's some kind of caveats. So this was only kind of able to happen because Austin's beaters weren't playing aggressively against us because it was during secret play. So um, you might have to utilize this at a time when the office beaters aren't really attacking. So that could be during seeker play when you're down, or maybe during one and a half when the offensive bludgers are um, not around. 
Um, but it's something to think about, and I, I hope that theaters try and develop this a little bit more going forwards. I think, yeah, you do kind of show that you kind of put in some of the concepts you've talked about already. I think Max at one point does the throwback as he's taking an exchange to you, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. So it's really a combination of all the things you've been talking about in one fluid motion almost. All right, awesome. Um, so we covered a ton. Um, one of the key things when you have one budger is you got to work with your chasers. So here are some tips um, for chasers, whether you're a coach or your chaser watching this, um, or if you're a beater, um, you're a captain. Um, so we're getting control and defending with one budget is a team effort. So we gain control and offense with chasers. So Quaffle should be threatening at the same time, possibly by switching sides of the field, um, force hard decision on opposing beaters. Uh, that Quaffle is literally make or break. That Quaffle has to put pressure um, because if the opposing beaters don't have to pay attention to Quaffle and just focus on you, you're not going to win that battle. Um, then another option is beating out um, point defenders before going for control. Um, so beat out point defender and then go for control. That way Quaffle is freed up. They can fall right behind, putting a lot of pressure. And then finally, don't anticipate budget control if Quaffle is about to be turned over. So really pay attention and communicate with your chasers. If your chasers um, take a long shot um, and you're not aware of it and you go for control, that might result in fast break the other way. Um, and then defending with one budger, um, you really have to trust your chasers. Um, know which prioritize to help your chasers. The cough will drive in the pass. Um, as a team, you should decide um, where your chasers are strongest. Are they really strong at stop and drive, really good tacklers? Or are they better at playing off ball defending? Whatever that may be, you as a beater with budgers should cover the other side. So whether that's stopping the drive and relying on your chasers to cover the pass, or stopping the passes and relying on your chasers to stop the drive. Um, and then trust your chasers to come to your weak spots. You only have one budget. You can only do so much. You just got to trust your team. Um, almost blind trust if you need to because um, you will not have success unless you have that trust. Yeah, and, and as a chaser, I mean, there's definitely things you can do to make the beaters' lives easier as well. Uh, you mentioned the threatening at the same time, but and you also mentioned the tap beats. I feel like a lot of times point defenders get tapped out and the ball carrier doesn't actually move off of that. So... Yes, it hypothetically yes. opened things up, but it doesn't actually open anything up because the beaters don't have to respond to a qualifier player that's not moving, and they just make the switch and the play just goes on. There's so many tap beats that are basically for naught. Uh, same thing with just standing on one spot in the field because then the beater's eyes are basically focusing right through the opposing beaters onto the qualifier player and they're in position. If you're actually moving the ball around, it actually can do something to make your beater's life a little bit easier because uh, I think we've all seen ch chasers who have not made their beater's lives any easier. Yes, exactly. I cannot emphasize those points enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think it's going to do it for this one. Um, we're looking forward to parts two and three uh, for sure, which you can see the subject matter here uh, when we can record those. Uh, Max and Lulu, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, this is really awesome, awesome content. I think it'll be a, a great piece uh, for experienced and new beaters alike. So thanks for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next time. Take care.